There we go. Uh, so whether this is your first Hein Online webinar or you are a regular attendee, uh, I want to thank you all for attending today. We, I genuinely, genuinely appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to sit down and talk about Hein Online. Uh, today's topic of the webinar is Unlocking the Past, Navigating Hein Online for Legal Genealogy Research. So our guest presenter today is Judy Russell. Judy is the legal genealogist and is a genealogist with a law degree. Uh, she writes, teaches, and lectures on a wide variety of genealogical topics. She provides expert guidance through the murky territory where law and family history intersect. Judy's a Colorado native with deep roots in the American South on her mother's side and entirely in Germany on her father's side. She holds a bachelor's degree from George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and a law degree from Rutgers School of Law in Newark. Uh, before retiring, Judy worked as a newspaper reporter, a trade association writer, a legal investigator, a defense attorney, a federal prosecutor, a law editor, and for more than 20 years, she was an adjunct member of the faculty at Rutgers Law School. As an internationally known lecturer, course coordinator, and faculty member at numerous genealogical institutes, Judy holds credentials as a certified genealogist, a certified genealogical lecturer from the Board of Certification of Genealogists. She's a member of the Association of Professional Genealogists, the National Genealogical Society, and numerous state and regional genealogical societies. So uh, needless to say, Judy is uh, the right person to be talking to us today. Uh, and me. Uh, I am your Hein Online expert. My name is Tim Hoagie. I am the Senior Director of Sales at Hein Online. Uh, I've worked with Hein Online for over 15 years and have quite a deep understanding of the database and how it can best serve your library's needs, uh, to all sorts of different libraries, of course. Uh, I live in the Buffalo area where Hein Online is based and most recently moved to Buffalo South Towns with my wife, my kids, and my two Boykin Spaniels. So what are we going to do today uh, in the webinar? Uh, well, first, we're going to do a brief introduction about Hein Online and some of the topics and some of the databases that Judy's going to be talking about today. Then I'm going to toss it over to Judy, and she's going to talk a little bit about how she uses Hein Online and the different databases to do her, her genealogical research. And then we'll try and save some time at the end to do questions and answers. I do ask if you have throughout um, Judy's presentation, if you have questions that pop up, use the Q&A section in, in Zoom and, and we can then come back to your, um, your question at the end of the presentation. So one of the databases that we do know that Judy uses and she'll be talking about uh, today a little bit is our Honeyline State U.S. State Package. It's comprised of seven, da seven, seven databases, nearly 31 million pages of content. It's got the legal history of the 50 states, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Right now, we're offering a 15% discount off the, your first year's subscription. That promotion is going to run until the end of June 30th. So if you're interested in taking a look at that, if you're not currently a subscriber, uh, just let us know and we'll, we'll be happy to set you up for the trial. So the, the seven databases that are included within the U.S. state package are the state constitutions illustrated, and that covers all 50 states and the related documents uh, related to the state constitutions. Session laws of all 50 states, as well as, as I mentioned, D.C., Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, as well as federal level session laws. Uh, the historical archive of state statutes, all 50 states going back to 1717. State attorney general opinions, pre-statehood legal materials, state reports, a historical ar archive, again, that covers all 50 states, and uh, the Bar Journals Library, which covers 150 plus titles, including nearly all state bar journals. Of course, we like to support our users, so we have dedicated libguides specifically re regarding these different databases and the U.S. state package as a whole. You can always find any of the libguides that we have for the different database packages under the help heading within Hein Online um, when, you're with, when you're within the database. In addition to the libguides, of course, we have our tips and tricks, additional related resources, relevant Hein Online blog articles, and so on. 
if you are not currently a subscriber to Hein Online, obviously we're always happy to provide a trial for you. We provide unlimited campus-wide access if you're an academic institution. If you're not, if you're a public library, we're happy to give you a, a trial as well or a firm. We provide IP and proxy authentication, access to more than 30 academic databases, we provide the same chat and support as we do to all of our subscribers. We have free training resources and a ton more of information. So if you are interested in any of the material that we talk about today, please let us know. You can reach out to us at a, via a telephone, email, or on the website. And of course, don't forget all of our different social media outreaches. So we're on Twitter, YouTube, of course, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, and TikTok. All right. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw this over to Judy. Just one moment. And I just got to make Judy a presenter, a host. All right, Judy, the floor is go. yours. Terrific. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me, and thanks for everybody for being here. You know, I'm really grateful to Hein Online for this opportunity because I want to emphasize the and focus on the use of some of these terrific resources for a purpose that I suspect is a little different from what many of you are accustomed to. So I'm not talking here today as somebody with a law degree who might need help with legal research, I'm really talking as a genealogist, somebody who focuses on family history and using resources for what today I think we could all agree is one of the most popular pastimes, certainly in the United States. I mean, as far back as 2014, um, USA Today was saying that genealogy was the second most popular hobby in the United States, second only to gardening, and the second most popular category of website visited with the first most popular being pornography. Now, I'm not sure about either of those claims. I mean, let's face it, assertions without sources can be fiction, but clearly this is something that's booming, growing in popularity. And I wanna make a distinction here between history and the subset that's family history. Because if we're doing historical research, we come across an image like this. Our focus is going to be the battle as a whole, its significance to the course of the Revolutionary War, the ultimate establishment of a United States free of British control. But if we're looking at this from the standpoint of family history, we're not looking at the macro view. We're looking at a micro view. A single individual, maybe a single soldier who took part in that Battle of Trenton on Christmas Day, 1776. We want to accurately place that soldier in the context of his family at their time and in their place. So just as a hypothetical, we're going to be looking for information about somebody named Briscoe. He ended up in Kentucky around the time of Kentucky statehood, and we want more information. As a genealogist, if I'm looking for somebody in Kentucky at statehood, which is 1792, I would probably start with the United States Census from 1790. Now, that would be Virginia. And we would quickly find out that those records don't survive to today for us to use might consider 1800, it's only a few years later. Um, they don't survive either. Minor little matter of a dust up with the British called the War of 1812. Now we could go on, we could look at other typical genealogical resources. We could think about birth records, which don't exist in Kentucky before the 1850s. We might consider death records and they don't exist before 1911 on a statewide basis. That's way too late to be of any assistance in our particular case. Now, if you happen to be a genealogical blogger and a genealogist with a law degree, my next 
option would be to look at court and related records that could help shed light on this. And when we consider doing courthouse level research in a jurisdiction like Kentucky, one of the things we have to consider is the potential for records loss. It's not a pretty picture in Kentucky. Every shaded county has records lost due to war or natural disaster or just plain benign neglect. Now, this isn't unique to Kentucky. This isn't even unique to the American South. This records loss is a persistent and a major issue whenever we look at records that were kept at a local or county level. Because let's face it, they were mostly in buildings built of wood, subject to fire and flood and more. So our laundry list of genealogical records doesn't look really good or hopeful in finding our Briscoe in Kentucky in 1790. So what else could there be? And here's where I want you to focus on a resource that I consider to be one of the very best for family history research, but is clearly one of the least utilized for family history research. And that resource is the law itself. Whether we're talking about a public law setting out the age at which people could marry with or without parental consent, or a private law that's passed for the benefit of a single individual or group of individuals, it's so often the law that fills in the missing pieces for family history research. And if I were talking to a group of genealogists or even just to general genealogical librarians, I would probably start talking about a genealogical resource like Cindy's List, for example, an aggregator of web-based links to information and databases and resources that genealogists can use to try to build a family history. One thing that I like very much about Cindy's List is on the reference page for every state, here is Kentucky, there's a link to the laws and the statutes within that jurisdiction. You click on that link, it's going to take you to a page collecting the known resources for modern and historical laws and statutes in that jurisdiction. Now, I love this service. I love the quote up at the top that to understand the records, we have to understand the laws of the time and the place where the records were created. And quite frankly, I would like that quote, even if it was from somebody other than me. But when you look at the list of resources available for Kentucky, even in a central aggregator like this one, they're fairly limited. Now, there are some jurisdictions that do a great job pulling together their historical legal materials. Kentucky isn't one of them. If I were doing this research generally, I'd be spending time with the search mechanisms and techniques at Google Books and Hathi Trust Digital Library and Internet Archive and hoping that I would find the historical laws for Kentucky at the time and place. And I might not find them, particularly when we consider, you know, our example is we think the guy ended up in Woodford County, Kentucky, and yeah, that's one of the ones with records loss. But I'm not gonna do my usual genealogical shtick today, because for this audience, there's a better, faster, vastly more complete resource available to assist any patron with a question about the laws in 1792, even in Woodford County, Kentucky. And that's the databases on Hein Online. Now, we haven't got time to go through all of them. So I'm going to focus on some ask you to take a look at them all. But there's one in particular 
that's more complete, more thorough, more valuable for genealogical resource than, and I'm not overstating this, any other single legal database on the planet. And that is the Session Laws Library, described in the LibGuide accurately as the only complete source of laws from all 50 states, beginning with the territorial, colonial, and early statehood laws and continuing through to today. Now, this one database by itself is worth the price of admission to Hein Online for genealogical research. And I want you to know right off the bat, I'm not getting paid for this presentation. I don't have a free Hein Online subscription. I wish I did. You see that all of mine are listed trial. It runs out in two days. The bottom line is that rather than fighting with the search mechanisms of various online book services and hoping that the coverage is what I need, this one set of records has every law of every jurisdiction from every time that I might want. If I'm going to get lucky, if I'm going to find information in the laws, I can find it with one-stop shopping. And, and here's the proof. You want to know about the Briscoe who lived in Woodford County, Kentucky in 1792? He's there in the laws. This statute passed on the 26th of June, 1792, established a town at Woodford Courthouse. And the land on which the courthouse and other public buildings were to be built was the property, the law tells us, of Hezekiah Briscoe. He was then considered an infant, meaning he was under the age of 21. We get the name of his guardian, John Briscoe. As genealogists, we teach other genealogists, don't just look at the subject, look at his fan club, his friends, his associates, his neighbors. You know what? They're listed here too. John Watkins, Richard Young, Cave Johnson, seven men in, in all who were the trustees to establish the town where that courthouse was going to be built. Now, this is a public law. It didn't benefit Hezekiah Briscoe particularly, but it named him and others and the roles they were to play in creating this jurisdiction. This is in one volume, the very first volume of Kentucky state laws. It only takes up 52 pages. But in those 52 pages are public laws impacting ancestors and private laws impacting private individuals. There are five of these laws in just this first volume, doing things like dividing land between one business partner and the heirs of another, or appointing trustees to buy or sell lands for people who couldn't do it themselves and allowing people who'd settled in one particular town, Bairdstown, more time to do what they needed to do to make sure they would ultimately own the land they built on. These are private laws. They're among the most valuable genealogical resources that exist. They cover a wide array of topics. Thinking about the law of private laws, its business monopolies, and any claim against a government at any level, and give me back my tax money because I didn't owe it. Asking for benefits on immigration or naturalization, getting a pension or bounty land, looking to be relieved from the impact of other laws. Things like manumission of the enslaved or clearing title to land. Settling an estate after someone died without a will, getting a change of name, establishing legitimacy within a family, even divorce, handled as a matter of private law. If your patron comes in with a question about a way an ancestor interacted with government, there could be a private law. Lots of them. When we think about the business of government, it was overwhelmingly involved in private matters up until 
as late as the late 1800s, estimates are that as many as 70% of all laws passed up until the late 1800s were private laws. Just as one example of this, if you look at the volume of laws passed in Virginia in 1889-90, the public laws took 252 pages to print. The private laws took more than a thousand pages. And that's where this database is priceless. Because of course we have the ability to search across the entire library or within a single volume. We can search by keyword, by location, by a surname, by a full name. We can even just kind of get a sense of whether or not there are private laws in this volume by searching for the words relief of, because so many of these private laws were entitled an act for the relief of John Smith or whoever. So do a search for relief of, limited to this one volume of late 19th century Virginia statutes. There are more than a hundred different references from relief from taxes or relief of the, somebody who acted as a surety relief from fines. This is not just in Virginia. This is true generally. There are laws like this of genealogical significance that exist everywhere. And they tell stories of our families. Consider this statute from Indiana in 1831. If we take a closer look at it, what it tells us is that the bands of matrimony heretofore existing between Daniel Bilderback and Abigail, his wife, are dissolved. That's a divorce. And that the bands of matrimony now existing between James Leonard and Abigail are legalized. Now, you know what that means. Before this law was passed, this private law for divorce, Abigail was married to two guys. Daniel and James. It took an act of the legislature to settle this, to legally end her marriage to Daniel and to ratify the legality of her marriage to James. Now, you know there's a backstory there. You can find the story of the name change in 1844 Mississippi. And this one not only gives us a name, it proves a relationship. Again, looking more closely, James Isaac Thornton Martin of Choctaw County had his name changed to James T. Killo, but that's not all. He's identified as the natural son of David Killo. This doesn't just change his name, it legitimates him as the son and heir of his father, David. These session laws can also give names to the nameless, as was done in 1792 in Virginia. The title of this private law alone tells us about the emancipation of Abraham, an enslaved man. He was the son of a free man of color from King William County. His liberty was purchased by the man his father left in charge of his estate. The statute legally recognizes that freedom. So I love session laws. These private laws are fabulous, but these are not the only laws we can use for genealogical research. Laws in general are invaluable, answering genealogical questions that are crucial to accurately reconstructing lives. You think about all the ways the law could have affected that soldier in 1776. How old did he have to be even to serve in the militia? How old did he have to be to marry with or without parental consent? Was he qualified to vote? Could he serve on a jury? If he died in the Revolutionary War, what happened to his property? 
Now, all of those can be answered looking at the law. And an easier database to use a different collection of laws are the codes and compilations in the database state statutes at historical archive. Because remember, session laws are purely chronological, year by year, not organized by topic. These codes and compilations pull all those laws together and organize them by topic. So it's a lot easier if my question is, what were the grounds for divorce in Alabama in 1865 to look at the laws of Alabama and the code enacted most closely in time to the question? So I would start with the revised code of 1867. Click on that link to open that resource. Search within the volume for the word divorce to see how and where it appears. You get a whole bunch of stuff, including an entire title on divorce and alimony with a very first section that sets out the grounds for divorce. And I can do the same thing for every one of my questions. Malicious service, age for marriage, voter qualifications, jury qualifications, and so much more. I want to emphasize this isn't just a matter of state law. We want to think about federal law as well. So the United States statutes at large, fabulous resource for this. Starting around 1845, the volumes would include both public and private laws. Up until 1845, you want to look at one volume, volume six of the United States statutes at large. Now, it tells you these are public statutes at large. That's a fib. Every statute in this volume is a private law from the very first one passed after the Constitution was effected. Um, provided military pay to a French officer in the revolution, going all the way up to March of 1845, when a woman who had been taken as a child from her home in Pennsylvania in an Indian raid, who had married into the tribe, had children and grandchildren in the tribe, was allowed with her tribe to stay east of the Mississippi and not be removed with the rest of the native tribes through a private law passed by Congress. Now, when we're looking at these resources, we need to remember we're only going to get part of the story. That volume six, page 263, tells the story of the, an act for the relief of Peggy Mellon. But it doesn't give us much detail. It says the Secretary of War can issue a land warrant to her for bounty land that a man named Stebbins would have gotten if he'd lived. There's a backstory. It's not in the statute. You will find it on Hein Online if you look beyond the laws. There are supporting records and documents. Certainly something of the backstory of Peggy Mellon is in another Hein Online database. The US Congressional Documents is another database that supports the federal statutes. If I do a search in that broader database for Peggy Mellon, I get the rest of the story. Cursor down on that page, we find out that Peggy Mellon was the mother of that soldier, Alfred Stebbins. He had died in the service of the United States and he didn't leave any legal heirs. Of course, we're talking about a time period when a mother would not have been considered the legal heir of her son. So she asked Congress to give her the land he would have gotten if he'd lived. And Congress gave it to her. So is there more? Oh, yeah, there's more. Still looking beyond the laws? Every time you get to a new database, to a new library, take a look and see what all is included. Because again, if we look at those congressional documents, thinking about possible things that can be used to fill out a family history, 
we find in there the American State Papers. And there's an entire volume setting out claims against the United States. There's a whole wide variety of these claims that are included in here. There's everything from a request for consideration because he'd gone to trouble and expense in apprehending a bad guy to somebody asking for indemnity because his enslaved man had been killed in the military service of the government. Now, I started out saying we don't have time to go into detail for all of the elements that are on Hein Online, even the elements that are in that, that state statutes database. But there's so much more than just that. I'm going to take a moment, though, to emphasize two additional databases, two other key databases that exist on Hein Online that are of enormous significance to genealogical research. First and foremost, given the history of this country, the database Slavery in America and the World has an unparalleled collection of slavery statutes in the United States. Time-wise, these are limited to the statehood period. So if you're researching colonial timeframes, you want to look at the session laws database. But once we get to the Constitution, 1787 to 89, for the time of statehood, there is nothing that exists anywhere that's more complete to study the legal framework of slavery than this database. And happily, this is one of the databases that Hein makes free, I believe, Tim can correct me, to any library that has any Hein online subscription. That is correct. Terrific. This is fabulous resource. Actually, Absolutely Judy, marvelous. You don't even need to have a Hein online subscription. It's completely free to anyone who wants access. There you go. The other key database that literally we don't have time to talk about, but is incredibly valuable for genealogical research, is for case law rather than for statutes. So the State Reports Historical Archive is, again, a very broad and deep resource for those whose ancestors may have ended up in the pages of reported cases from colonial times forward. So here's a bottom line, and then we'll go on and see what questions folks have got. The bottom line to me as a genealogist is that the law itself is a key genealogical resource. Accessing that law is critically important to family historians. And most of the time, that access is tough. There are some states that are terrific in pulling together their historical materials. That's the exception, not the rule. Finding the records of the law from the time and the place when an ancestral couple or family may have lived there is a slog, unless you have access to Hein Online's databases because nowhere is it more complete or more accessible or just frankly more useful to family historians than it is on Hein Online. I hope in these few minutes that I've shown you just a few ways that we can unlock the past to navigate Hein Online for legal genealogy research and in so doing, help bring families back to life using the law itself as our resource. 
So with that, Tim, let's see what questions folks have got. Awesome. Thank you so much, Judy. That was incredible. And I just want to make sure I point out uh, at the bottom of your screen here, you can be accessed at www.legalgenealogist.com. And if I, I believe everyone can see your email is legalgenealogist at gmail.com, correct? That is correct. Awesome. Uh, let's see. So in terms of questions, we have a couple here. Uh, Steven says he's, he agrees. Session Laws Library is worth it. Um, Connie says it's the only way you can access private laws is through HeinOnline.com. It's, it's not the only way. You know, we, we know, for example, that some private laws are published either within the volumes of the, the session laws of each jurisdiction or as a separate volume of session laws. And a lot of those have been digitized and may be available on Google Books or Internet Archive or Hottie Trust Digital Library. It isn't the fact that the only way you can get to them is on Hein Online. It's the, it's the easy way to get to them, all in one place, all at one time, all with a single search engine. And I frankly don't know of that resource that exists anywhere else. And that's the reason why I'm I'm sold personally. I, every time I can get access to Hein Online uh, and that session laws database by itself, I want that. The awesome. other problem that I will tell you flat out exists is that even in some of the state libraries, they don't have all of the session laws going back to the beginning in their jurisdictions. And they certainly haven't digitized them or made them available online. So some of the very earliest session laws, the only place you can get digital access is on Hein Online. Gotcha. All right, we have uh, Sheila is asking, how do we get access to the Slavery in America and the World History Database if we do not have Hein Online? All right, Sheila, all you need to do, if you can go on Google and search, search Hein Online, Slavery in America and the World, the first result that should come up would be the Slavery in the Wor America and the World Database page on Hein Online. There's a way, there should be a link to register right on that page. You actually will get access to a whole suite of databases that we call our social justice suite. That includes the slavery in America and the world, uh, uh, social justice, uh, an LGBTQ plus database, uh, gun regulation, legislation in America. There's a whole suite in there that, that uh, you'll, you can get free access to. There's no gotchas. Uh, anyone can get access to it. So go ahead and, and find that. If you have questions, any further questions, feel free to reach out to us um, uh, and uh, we can help you out with that. Uh, let's I've, see. I've written about the fact that Hein Online has made these resources available for free to the, the general community. And, you know, as a, as a matter of, of being a good social citizen, um, my thanks to Hein Online for that. Absolutely. Uh, let's see here. We have uh, just a couple more questions. Uh, Adrian uh, says, hello, Judy. I'm a student at the Midwest African American Genealogy Institute. Love to see you online. Uh, let's see. Is any part of the state package? So no, nothing within the state package is part of the academic core. This, this, the U.S. state package is a separate add-on from academic core. Uh, but if you're interested in taking a look at it, like I said previously, happy to set you up with a free trial. All of the documents, uh, Madison asked if, if the documents are fully searchable. Everything across Hein Online is completely full text searchable, uh, whether it's the session laws, journals, American Law Institute material, you name it, uh, even the free material, the, the Slavery in the American World database, completely full text searchable. Um, but, but, uh, uh, Judy, you actually mentioned it, it's a great resource for finding information about people of color uh, because it can be difficult for some users. Angel uh, mentioned that, that it can be difficult to find information for their community. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Desiree asked if there's a uh, history about immigration trends through borderline borderland crossings uh that you're more likely to find that in in your government documents um you know because you're talking about uh, about setting up trends and that sort of thing you're not going to find the the crossings themselves those will be uh from the national archives okay. but in terms of 
explanations of the trends and historical studies and stuff like that, those are generally published by the United States government. Now, publishing office used to be printing office, and a lot of those are available on Hein Online. Cool. And then the last one, and you may or may not know this, I don't know off the top of my head. Do you know if the slave statues, statutes also have the Freedmen's Records? No, the Freedmen's Bureau records are, are a huge set of post-Civil War records. They're available for free online on Family Search. But those, those would not, you know, there's no sense in duplicating that kind of record set. Um, so for that, I would go to Family Search. Excellent. All right. Well, Judy, I think that's about it in terms of our, our questions right now. Thank you again for this incredible, very informative presentation. I really appreciate your time and, and, and sitting down with us. And uh, if the, do you have anything else you want to wrap up with? Just that I hope that an awful lot of libraries awfully close to where I'm going to be researching are going to be signing up for the session laws pass package. <laughs> All right, Judy. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. I appreciate your time. And uh, we'll see you next month for the next Time Online webinar. Have a great day.